Hi all, well, welcome to another podcast. Today, I'm joined with Kanishka and Vivian. We'll be talking about parasites and how we may, may be able to use them to enhance the human race. But first, we must establish, what are parasites? So, um, a parasite is an organism that lives uh, on or in a host organism and gets, it fo- gets its food uh, from or at its host expense. So, there are three main classes of parasites that can cause disease in humans. Protozoa, uh, helminths, and ectoparasites. Uh, protozoa are microscopic uh, unicellular organisms that can be free living or parasitic in nature uh, and they're able to multiply in humans uh, which contributes to their survival and also permits serious infection to develop uh, from just a single organism. Um, that transmission is mainly through human intestine or other um, uh, or other routes such as fecal or a root. Uh, helmets are large multicellular organisms that are generally visible to the naked eye in their adult stages um, and like protozoa, helmets can either be free living or parasitic in nature. In their adult form, helmets cannot multiply, uh, but there are three main groups uh, of helmets, which are flatworms, thorny heads, and, uh, and thorny headed worms, and round worms, aka uh, also known as, sorry, uh, nematodes. Um, and although the term uh, ectoparasite can broadly include blood sucking arthropods, such as mosquitoes, uh, this term is generally used more narrowly to refer to organisms such as ticks, fleas, uh, lice, and mice that attach or burrow into the skin and remain there for uh, relatively short periods of time, uh, long periods of time, such as weeks to months. Uh, and arthropods are important in causing diseases in their own right, but even more important as vectors or transmitters of different pathogens. So how do parasites link to allergies? So one theory of allergies is that our hyperclean modern society has greatly reduced human exposure to parasites and consequently the immune system doesn't have much to do except pick fights essentially with proteins from peanuts or pollen. So researcher John Turton tried this in the 1970s. A chronic allergy sufferer who worked for the Medical Research Council in the United Kingdom uh, was intentionally infected uh, with a parasitic hookworm and he later reported that his allergic reactions were reduced for the two years that the parasites had lived in him. So there's currently more extensive study to bear this out, but scientists are investigating this angle and it's been common, like, I don't know about you guys, but when I was younger, my mom would always tell me to play outside more so that you get exposed to common bugs. So you increase the strength of your immune system and you don't stay inside. And that's one of the news articles that often comes up about how the modern generation is always staying inside and therefore aren't exposed to enough bugs as such in the outside world. Um, so how does it affect irritable bowel syndrome? I've heard some stuff about that, right? Yeah, so IBS and parasites get um, misdiagnosed quite often. Just a little quick intro to irritable bowel syndrome. It's a common condition that affects the digestive system, causes symptoms like stomach cramps, bloating, diarrhea. Um, and it's a lifelong problem. There's no cure to it, but diet changes and medicines can often help control the symptoms. So with parasites, um, there's two common intestinal parasites known as B. hominis and D. frigillis. Uh, the gastro bugs caused by these parasites share similar symptoms to IBS. Uh, a few of these similar symptoms, like I just mentioned, uh, constipation, diarrhea, stomach pains. Uh, some studies have also found both these parasites to be common in IBS sufferers. And so there's a lot of misdiagnosis that's occurring between parasite infections and IBS. Uh, There's also the chance that the presence of these parasites worsen IBS symptoms in some individuals. There's several studies that show gastro bugs caused by both the virus and and parasites appear to increase the risk of developing IBS. So it tends to be higher for parasitic bacterial uh, gastro bugs rather than viral. Uh, the risk is actually four to six times higher than experiencing an episode of gastro. Mm. So parasites uh, have a big profound effect on a lot of syndromes that are very, very common. Yeah. So I've heard that another use of parasites could be to help heal wounds quicker. Is that true? Um, um, yeah. So parasites in terms of healing wounds has is, is kind of debated. So uh, the medic history of leeches is one which can be used. Uh, and Uh, That dates back several thousands of years. Um, And early physicians used blood-sucking leeches to treat common illnesses such as ear ear infections, uh, hemorrhoids, and some other um, illnesses. But leeches are still used today, most prominently in the post-surgical wound care. 
Um, and worm-like creatures uh, exude a peptide that prevents blood clots. Um, and a study from the Journal of Nursing 20, uh, 2010 noted that leeches are powerful enough to fight off otherwise antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Um, and that's obviously quite interesting. Uh, maggots, much like leeches, uh, have been associated with treating wounds and other ailments. Um, so the medical world is experiencing something of a resurgence in terms of maggot therapy. Um, with, in late 2014, the Food and Drug Administration approving maggots uh, to treat necrotic tissue and non-healing soft tissue wounds. Uh, and maggots work essentially because they have a very specific niche uh, and consume only ne necrotic tissue without touching otherwise healthy sections of skin uh, and muscle. With necrotic tissue obviously being dead or devitalized tissue, so that tissue cannot be salvaged in the same way and needs to be removed to allow a wound to heal. But obviously this parasite could change that. Plus, um, maggots release certain chemicals which will help healthy skin grow more efficiently. Um, and there were a couple other types of um, uh, parasites, such as the South Asian uh, liver fluke, which could uh, treat bile duct cancer, go a long way to creating a vaccine for bile duct cancer. Um, and um, that's obviously very promising in terms of that whole idea. But uh, one of the most interesting studies was the idea that he, um, that certain parasites could stimulate a certain response within tissue bodies. Um, so researchers have long believed that adult stem cells can contribute to the wound healing in tissues like the gut and the skin. Um, and experiments using parasitic worms in the mouse gut have re re revealed a surprising form of wound repair. Um, so a paper by UC San Francisco scientists uh, published on June 27th in Nature magazine found that as parasites dug into mouse intestinal walls, the gut responded by re by reactivating a type of cell previously seen only in fetal tissue. Um, and so this, so that's obviously very promising in terms of it could cause a paradigm shift in terms of our understanding of how the, the mammalian body can repair damage. Um, and it gives us, uh, as like uh, and gives scientists, a new kind of treatment method and a new a whole new world of potential so essentially what happened was larvae from parasites invaded the gut in a mouse uh, in a mouse's intestine burying themselves to uh deep into the tissue uh, and based on prevailing ideas in the field the scientists predicted that in response nearby stem cells would increase their productivity and patch up the uh, the wound uh, the wounds the worm created but instead the stem cell signs disappeared completely so the fluorescent markers that stem cells have been tagged with just disappeared um and yet with no identifiable stem cells in the area the wound tissue regenerated more quickly than ever which always seems very odd but what happened was they noticed the uh, recurrence of a different gene known as uh, scar one and using antibody staining for scar one for the scar one protein the researchers realized where the stem cells disappeared and they realized that a different gene uh, program was expressed instead and that uh, resembled the way the gut the, the gut developed uh, in utero so essentially what it did was it um it kind of took the gut back to like a, a, a f like a fetal state uh, and kind of grew it again. Uh, and the gut is repurposing a fetal state in order to recover from injury, according to the lead scientist on that, which is very promising because they've also prophesized that it may have a similar response in other tissues. What about multiple sclerosis? Yeah, so there's a clinical trial underway in Europe at the moment, and that's investigating uh, whether certain parasitic infections could protect against it. And the trial was inspired by an earlier study, and this was from Argentina, and it found that people with MS who are naturally infected with gut parasites experience much milder symptoms of the disease. So one theory is that hookworms trigger regulatory T cells, which keep inflammation under control in the body. Or it could be that the parasites induce changes in the gut flora that somehow mitigate the symptoms of multiple uh, MS. Sorry. Um, and I just wanted to move on swiftly to what do you think are the future prospects of this? Do you think that we could use this to enhance ourselves, perhaps uh, rather comically shown in the movie Venom? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so with regards to potential, I think it has a lot of future potential for clinical use and to be used in the formation of vaccines, uh, as I mentioned, with the Southeast Asian uh, river fluke uh, and in stimulating tissue responses, uh, like I mentioned with the study. 
Um, furthermore, as um, uh, as I've talked about uh, with regards healing wounds, I think it can potentially go along with the affecting the lives of diabetics. But the negatives, as Vivian mentioned, with uh, irrit for, uh, with irritable bowel syndrome, uh, mm -hmm. need to be considered heavily as well. Uh, but I think we can hope to see prioritize use with more research quite soon. But like I said, as with anything, it needs to be researched heavily and uh, really thought about before using it before clinical use. I think, uh, Vivian, do you have anything to add to that or shall I move on to the summary? I think we should move on to the summary. Okay. So overall, we can see that there's multiple uses for parasites at the moment uh, in terms of mitigating symptoms and even removing certain allergies as well. So it's quite promising in terms of biological potential for parasites in the human body. But we'll just have to wait and see as at the moment there's a large focus on AI and cybernetics uh, and nanotechnology in comparison to biological parasites. But it might be the case that stuff that we have on our planet already could be uh, much more helpful and much have much more potential than AI. And so I think that will bring us nicely onto the close of our podcast. Yeah. Um, thank you guys for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Make sure you tune in for more podcasts and check out some of our previous ones. If you have any topics that you'd like us to discuss, leave them in the Google forms below uh, and we'll get through those as soon as possible. Uh, make sure you follow our Instagram at BioBulletin um, and our newly formed Twitter, uh, which is bio underscore bulletin. Uh, and yeah, see you next week, guys. Thanks. For Thank listening. you. See you.